Thanks. <clears throat> Hello, this is Senate Government Operations. It is Tuesday, January 25th, and we are going to, our first um, item of business is to uh, talk about the staffing crisis at um, corrections. <clears throat> just, this is, this is just, there's no bill or anything like that. We just want to um, get information about it and what's being done and how how it's impacting the employees and the, the people who are incarcerated and stuff. And I'm going to um, have the committee introduce themselves because I don't think you've been on this committee before. So um, I'm, I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. I'm Anthony Felina from Washington County. Brian Collimore representing the Rutland County District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Keisha Ram Hinsdale, Chittenden County. <clears throat> and I want to, um, I'm going to welcome all of you, but I want to give, and maybe I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to anyway, I'm going to give a special welcome to Rachel, because this is a whole different um, position that we see you in. We were used to just running by the Lieutenant oh, Governor's yeah. office and stopping in for chat and hugs. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senator. And I'm glad you didn't mention the coffee. I was no good at making that. <laughs> <laughs> I never got any there anyway. <laughs> so with that, I think what we'll do is, um, Commissioner, um, if you would like to kick us off however you would like to do this, and we'll hear from you. We also have Steve Howard here, just from, from the VSEA to to represent the employee's point of view and how, how it's impacting them and where you're going and everything. So commissioner, if you would like to start off and just send us on our way, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Senator, for, for having me and for the whole committee for, for the invitation. Um, so for the record, I'm Nick Demmel. I'm the commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections. And from our team today, we've got our chief of operations, Al Cormier, and our public information officer, Rachel Feldman, who you introduced at the beginning, um, and certainly welcome them to weigh in at any point uh, as I testify about these important issues. Um, on the staffing challenge in particular, the department was facing a, a staffing crisis even before the COVID-19 pandemic kicked off uh, in 2020. What we've seen since then is just a further exasperation of that problem. Um, the, the pandemic has imposed uh, a lot of changes on our system. It's imposed, you know, pretty punishing time for staff. Um, you know, I think it's, it's clear that the, the pandemic has been impactful on everybody in society, both emotionally, mentally. Um, but when we pare that down and talk about our corrections workforce, um, these are frontline workers. They're first responders. Uh, they work 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Um, and, and we can't afford to not cover a post or, or not cover a shift. And so the burden on those individuals is, is even higher, I think, than the burden that's being faced throughout the rest of society. I know we share these pain points with our colleagues in the first responder and emergency services community, uh, with those in the hospitals. Um, it's very similar, the, the types of pain that we're facing for our workforce. And so it's certainly the top priority of this department to try to find ways to ease the burden on that team, uh, to, to lower the pressure, and to get people all the resources that they need to try to weather the storm. You know, the reality is we hope that as the pandemic winds down, um, that will create some more space for us to work. But at the end of the day, we're going to remain in a staffing challenge, uh, a staffing crisis here. And so it's something that we can't afford to wait for the pandemic to end. We need to be acting now. And I think the department's doing that. And I'll lay out a couple of the steps that we've been taking uh, in just a moment. Um, but I also think it's important to stop for a second and recognize that the, the amazing work that the department staff has done to keep our facilities running. Um, they are, they, they've been innovative and flexible and they've met the challenge. And as a result of their efforts, their ability to help us mitigate the COVID-19 impact on the facilities uh, we haven't lost a staff member or an incarcerated person to COVID-19 during the pandemic. And that's something only Vermont can say in the United States. Every other correction system has had fatalities as a result of this virus. 
Um, so, so I think it's important to pause there and just give them a moment of thanks and, and, and appreciation because they've done just amazing work to be able to pull that off. Um, a couple of the other ways that the, the pandemic has impacted our facilities, um, in order to mitigate the virus, we've had to reconfigure the way some of our facilities are set up so that we have those isolation and quarantine spaces. Um, that has direct impacts on our staffing, our ability to, to manage the facility because we need different types of staff in different places. We've had to move folks around within the facilities to accommodate those changes. And so it's not business as normal in DOC because of the pandemic, but those things have been vital to help us protect the population that's in our care and custody. Uh, and I think have also helped us protect our staff. We're also seeing second and third order effects of where the pandemic is impacting other organizations, other institutions, and that's falling back on the DOC to try to help them through. And so one of the best examples is, is the court system. You know, that for a long time now, the Vermont court system has been closed and, and court hearings have been conducted virtually. Um, a lot of the court work has not stopped, but it's been shifted to the Department of Corrections to do in-house. And, and our system, candidly, was not set up to, to address that type of thing. But here's another example of where our staff has just gone above and beyond, uh, have been just excellent partners to the court system, and really just jumped in and served in those roles. So they've functioned at times as a, a quasi-court clerk, as an ad hoc court clerk. Um, they've been helping people get their paperwork printed and help them prepare. They're getting the, the hearings ready for them and making sure the technology is working. These are all things that far exceed the borders of a normal correctional officer's duties, but they did it because it, was, it needed to be done and they were able to do it and they executed perfectly. Unfortunately, that comes at a cost. And so for the department, that's taking our staff offline uh, to be doing these court hearings, to be moving people around. As you can imagine, the most salient example of this that I can think of is we have our housing units separated from each other during the pandemic so that there's not a mixing of the individuals from different housing units as a way to stop the spread of the virus between housing units. But if you have multiple individuals from different housing units who need to come to a court hearing in a centralized location within a facility, we have to move those people around in a way that they don't interact. And so that requires an inordinate amount of staff to pull off that type of uh, movement. It sounds like a simple thing, but many staff are required to pull that off in a way that protects the health and safety of the individuals in our custody. And so when we talk about the staffing issue, it's we have the what everybody can think of as the staffing issue. How many people do you need and how many do you have and where's the delta there? But the impact is much more nuanced and it, it's spread throughout the system. And this is I bring up the courts not uh, to call them out because that's one specific example that we can point to where we're actually doing a lot more work than we did before with even fewer people. And we have the staffing crisis, which is amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so those are a couple of examples of, of how that is impacting our system. And we could go through a few more of those, but I think that conveys the point. So then the question becomes, what it, what's the department doing about it? And that's a tough question to answer. Um, I look at this problem as, both a staff issue and a staffing issue. And those are, are different in my opinion. So we, first and foremost, we need to take care of our staff. Uh, we need to show, uh, show that we view and value them as human beings, that we care about their well-being, uh, that, that we care about their careers here, and that the department is really invested in them as individuals. Um, and I think organizations who do that well have a very high retention rate because people, they want the benefits, they want money and, and to be paid for their job and for the work that they're doing. And that's important. But people also want to feel like they're a valued part of the organization that they work for. People often don't just go to work for money. They want to have a contribution, especially individuals in public service. And that's what everybody in the Department of Corrections is. And so the department needs to meet them there and show them that we care about them as human beings, we appreciate them, and we're gonna go out of our way to show that. Um, and so in my opinion, that's, that's a couple fold. First of all, that's a professional development issue. We need to be investing in their careers and keep them engaged, getting them new skills and new training. Uh, it's a wellness issue and getting them the wellness resources that the state is actually very good at providing, um, but making sure that, that our staff is leveraging those resources and the department is pushing them out 
messaging about them and so that they know that they're available at the ready. And even during this time where they're working uh, extremely long hours, they still have the time provided by the department to give them the space to be able to participate in some of those wellness resources. Um, it's also, I think, time that we review our promotion process and ensure that it's merit-based and fair and transparent. Um, and I think it's time that, that we look at how we schedule individuals. And by that, I mean, are we using the best technology available to make predictable, reliable schedules for our staff? And, and one of the things that I've heard a lot is it, it's challenging to work double shifts, you know, the eight hours plus the overtime shift. It's even more challenging when you can't plan for that in advance. And so we want to try to build in more predictability and reliability on the schedule for our staff so that they can plan for childcare needs or just plan for their family needs or plan for their own well-being. When will I get time off and how can I use that to best prepare myself, uh, you know, to start the next shift or whatever the case may be. So those are some of the areas that we're going to focus on in this year. Um, I think that won't be enough to be candid. What we need to do, though, in my approach to this problem is we need to layer as much on top of each other as we can. And hopefully in the aggregate, we'll begin to move the needle on the staffing crisis. It, it's an unfortunate reality, but there aren't, I haven't heard anyway, a lot of great ideas on how we're going to solve this problem. And the problem is so complex. You know, the state is facing a 2.8% unemployment rate. And that means that of the available individuals, they're all going to be highly competitive. Uh, so there's 2.8% of the population that's not working. Um, the population that is working, we have to be able to, to be competitive with them, both in benefits, but also in the providing a job, a career for somebody uh, that they're really going to take value in. And I think the work that we did in partnership with VSCA last year to create the side letter agreement, ad providing additional benefits was a great step, a uh, step in the right direction to get them, our team, the, the pay and benefits that they certainly deserve. Uh, and, and recognition for the fact that they've really gone out of their way above and beyond to serve the state. But again, I don't think pay is the only answer here. I think we're gonna have to do more. And so my approach to this is we layer as many things on top as possible and we slowly move the needle. If there are other ideas that people have, this department will certainly go out of its way to entertain those and try to implement them because I think all ideas need to be on the table. And I've been very open with our partners at VSCA with other partners in the legislature and with the administration that, that we're all ears for ideas and we'll certainly entertain anything that we can uh, to try to make this problem better. So I've spoken a lot. I'll pause there for a moment and let people uh, ask any questions that they have or we can move to any of the specifics that you'd like. So um, not seeing anybody else's hand up right now, I will ask a question and then I'll go to Senator Clarkson. Um, I, I've, I'm not sure how, I think that one of the, um, when you talked about professionalism, <coughs> that one of the issues is around training and the type of training and where the training is given. And um, I believe that the Criminal Justice Council has been, it has been suggested that they take on the training for corrections officers. And I just want, would like you to talk a little bit about training and <clears throat> kind of certification and disciplinary actions. And I know that a lot of it is uh, the disciplinary actions and stuff are part of um, the uh, negotiations with the um, employees unions, but just talk a little bit about that and how that works now and how you see it maybe working in the future if there's any, um, attention given to that? Yeah, certainly. I can speak to the discipline piece quickly, and then I'd like to hand it to Al to talk about the, the training academy and the training proposals that have been considered in the last couple of years um, and are still being considered today. On the discipline piece, you know, I think this is an area, and I don't want to speak for Steve, who I think is with us here. I think this is an area where the department and VSEA agree that the, the process has been a little slow in the past and could use some, some improvement. And that's something that I am wholeheartedly committed to and I've already tried to do in my short tenure here is, is speed up the process uh, for, for discipline. Um, you know, it's, it's a 
a complicated process and we want to make sure that we're affording everybody their due process and we want to make sure that the investigations that occur are thorough and so I don't want to compromise those portions of the process but I do firmly believe that it's something that we can tighten up and make quicker um, and it's certainly from the department's perspective and from the areas that I can control I will absolutely ha and have already started to do that and I think um, were we to plot this out on a chart, we'd see those timelines shortening, and, and that's something we're going to continue to do. Because I agree wholeheartedly uh, that we can't be handing, we can't let these processes drag out for long periods of time, particularly when we need people back at work. So if if the decision is ultimately made that they're able to return to duty, we want to make sure we can get them back to duty as quickly as possible. Um, and then in the instances where we have to separate from an employee, where we have to terminate. Um, we need to do that quickly as well, in part because, you know, I think the folks in our on our staff want to work with people with integrity, with people who make good faith decisions um, and who are good employees. And, and where we have uh, instances where the, the person violates that level of trust, um, we need to separate from them because it ultimately will bring down the morale of the department. Uh, regardless, it needs to be happening quicker than it had been. And so that's something that we're committed to. Um, on the question of training and the academy, I'd, I'd love to hand it with your permission, Senator, hand it over to Al, who, who's our resident expert on these areas. Please, thank you so much. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Al Cormier, Chief of Operations for the Department of Corrections. Um, so Act 56 that was signed into law last year uh, talks about the certification and decertification of correctional officers by the Criminal Justice Council. Um, we had worked with the council and presented a report to joint justice in October, I believe it was. Um, what we what we came to find out was this is going to be a very heavy lift should we move forward with the council being responsible for the certification and decertification of correctional officers. A lot of statutory language change that's going to be needed. Um, correctional officers are not considered law enforcement. Um, and with the certification process at the council, it specifically talks to law enforcement. Um, the other uh, barrier is correctional officers is defined in statute right now include correctional officers ones, correctional officer twos, correctional facility ship supervisors, community correctional officers, and probation and parole officers. So we'll need to separate the language and, and redefine in statute each one of those titles um, in, in order to determine levels of certification for, for each job class. Um, so we, we will continue to work with, with the council on that. Um, we were given an, an extension on, on timeline from joint justice in, in the fall to, to come forward. I, I can't, Rachel can give me a date on this one. I can't remember exactly when, when we're meeting again with, with them. But um, so th those conversations are ongoing we'll, and we'll continue to look at it. But uh, it is going to be um, a, a lot of work both internally and, um, you know, statutorily that, that will need some change. And, and the, uh, talking with the executive director at the, at the council related to the number of investigations that they already encounter through law enforcement uh, and the resources that will be needed to include corrections in that as well, uh, given the number of, of misconduct allegations that we deal with, where do we pull those resources? Where does that staffing resource come from? Um, I, can, can I just interject here with a question? <clears throat> Have you considered at all doing a, the certification and decertification process through um, OPR? They do um, right now many, many, many professions, and they don't determine the, um, the qualifications or what constitutes um, <clears throat> malfeasance, but they, they do the business end of it. Yeah, that, that was a topic that was brought up. We, we've not pursued that at, at this point. Another project we're working on and, and we're involved with is the Moss Group, which is a, a national advocacy or consulting group, corrections professionals, they are working with the Bureau of Justice Administration right now on bringing a consistent platform to all correctional training academies across the country so that there would be trans, um, 
the ability to transfer state to state um, and, and, and an, uh, a national certification board for all correctional academies. Vermont is part of that um, study right now. So we're hoping with, with that work and at, at a national level with the Moss Group and BJA that we'll see some change in our, in, in our academy. Um, they have taken our curriculum and, and have really highlighted and, and um, showcased the work that we are doing. They, they were very impressed with, it, with the curriculum that we're doing now. Um, so that was good feedback that we've gotten initially on that. Um, but we are working as part of the, the DRM report that came out of Chittenden to add an additional week of training to our academy now. Um, we're working with the Moss Group specifically on that as well. Um, so there's a lot of resources going into our training. Um, and then what we're looking at, at at the national level as well, I think will, will bring some, some benefits to our, our staff and our training in general. So I know, I know the uh, police academy and I know the fire academy, mm -hmm. but I don't know the corrections academy and who oversees it and who develops, you know, if there's an oversight group and do you rent space at the, in Pittsburgh at the police academy or where do you hold them and how, what the length of time is and stuff. I, if you, you don't have to answer all, all those things right now. We could oh, maybe go over it. And then if you can send it us the, all that information, that would be great. Okay, we can certainly, we can certainly put that together. Um, we are not at the Pittsburgh location. We, our training academy is in Lindenville. Um, it's where? Lindenville. Oh, okay. Um, Jim Rice is our academy director. And our, our current training is, is a five week program. Uh, but I, I would encourage anybody to, to come take a look at the, the, the building and where we are conducting our training. Uh, Governor Scott was there this, this past fall. Um, Secretary Mike Smith was there. Um, both seemed very impressed with, with the facility and, and what we were conducting and how we were conducting it um, with our classroom space and training space. Um, but always open to, to show, it, show it off. Um, I think we've got a pretty decent facility there right now. Well, oh yes, yeah, Senator Polina. Thank you. The commissioner mentioned something about reevaluating or evaluating the promotion policy. I'm just wondering if you could speak more about that from a from a staff point of view. I'm wondering whether or not I, I just feel like going to work for the corrections is something that's going to allow me to move up the ladder economically over time. Can you just talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think the second part of your, your question, the statement part, is absolutely the goal is to create uh, a system that people can believe in and rely on to have a meaningful for career here at the Department of Corrections. And we want people to be continually gaining new skills and new abilities and position them for success in a career here at the department. Um, so as part of our professional development planning, um, we want to, the state offers and the department itself and the state more broadly offers a, a wide suite of skills and training um, that we can expose people to. And then the department itself has many experiences within its own system that we could uh, get people trained up on and, and experience different things so that they're positioned for when they want to make that next move, either up the chain or to say it's a, a CO1 at a facility. So a line correction officer wants to become a supervisor. What skills will they need to do that? And we can lay that out for them. And then the department can find ways to invest in them to make sure they get those skills and position them for uh, promotion when that time comes. Or if the CO1 is, is looking down the road five or 10 years and says, you know, I'd really like to get to a probation or parole office. That's a different set of skills. So how can we make sure that in that period of time, the supervisors and the managers at the facilities are really making those investments and helping the person along the way? It's, it's a two-part investment. On the one hand, the department needs to be there to invest in the individual and provide them with the launching pad to do that. And then it's also incumbent on the individual to understand what they want out of their career and, and seize those opportunities. But we want to make and my goal, my personal goal here is to make that as easy on the employee as possible and so that they can take advantage of that. When I was mentioning you, the promotion. I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah. No, I think I was just a comment on where you're going now because you mentioned reevaluating the promotion policy. 
Yep. So I've been touring around all the facilities in the state since I started. And one of the common threads that I've heard when talking to the folks on the line out in the facilities is there's um, a perception that the promotion process isn't transparent. And there's a perception that it's maybe influenced by things aside from merit. And I'm not making a statement on whether either of those things are true, but the mere perception is a problem for me. And so my goal is to evaluate that promotion process and make sure that it is truly a merit-based process and that um, the best individuals who apply for promotion are the ones getting those promotions. Um, you know, it's a difficult situation at a facility in particular because it really is a triangle structure. And so the higher you go, the fewer positions are available. And so um, if individuals don't move out of those positions or they don't become available, it's difficult for people to get to that next level. That's sure. a problem that is harder to solve, but we certainly wanna make sure that the promotion process in general is merit-based, is reliable, and, and people feel is transparent. They understand why people are getting promoted, that the best candidates are moving forward. Can you remind me also, you mentioned competition for jobs in the slow unemployment era. What's the starting pay for at the corrections department for a corrections officer? Um, Al, do you know the, the number off the top of your head? It's around 19.50 an hour, 19 or 20. I think it just went up, but I, I can't recall. Exactly. So do you know? It's right around $20 an hour. I think that's better than law enforcement. <laughs> Steve, were you going to answer, help answer that? He shook his head. I'm just agreeing. It's, it's, it's about, I think it's about 19, uh, 19 and change. So, yes, Senator Rom Hinsdale? I think Senator Clarkson had her hand up first. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I, I wasn't sure if you had your hand up or if you were waving around. <laughs> no, I've had my hand up for a while. Um, thank you. Uh, just to quickly go to OPR before my question, uh, the OPR has experience on reciprocal licensing, Al. They do a lot. It's uh, it's good to see you, Al. I haven't seen you for a long time. So it's good to see you. Um, uh, so they have a lot of experience with reciprocal licenses. And as I mean, it, this is one of our uh, keys to unlocking some of our workforce challenges is trying to make it easier for people to come to us from all over the country um, with with similar skills and training. So um, as you go through that with the Moss Group, it, it another reason to go to our chair's suggestion is looking at OPR because they are terrific. And um, I guess I, I have a couple, I have two questions, which is, uh, Nicholas, welcome aboard. You're, you're new, you're young. And one of the biggest challenges we've had in corrections, as you're well aware of at the moment, is, is, is morale. And while all of what you've said is great, uh, it seems that there has been a distinct problem with morale in the corrections department. And I guess my question to you is, what are you do, what, what, given it's a top priority, what are you doing about that? I mean- Yeah, it's a great question, Senator. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. If you no, no. And then I just have a second part to my question. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think there's there's a couple of interesting things underway to really understand this problem set. I think it's easy for us to say um, there's a problem here, go fix it. Um, but without truly understanding the underlying problem, it's difficult to come up with solutions that actually work. And so um, the department has taken on a couple of different initiatives. Um, and first, we have the Prison Research Innovation Network Initiative, which is underway. Uh, it's a partnership between the Department of Corrections, the University of Vermont, and the Urban Institute. And they selected one facility in Vermont, Southern State, to do really a, a deep analysis and baseline to understand the corrections practice at that facility in Vermont and then identify pain points. And they did that a couple of different ways, but the, the two primary ways are they surveyed the entire staff there, anybody who would be willing to take the survey, and then they surveyed the incarcerated population. And the results they got were really telling, and we're gonna share those later this week. Um, and so that's an area that I think um, will be of, of high interest to this body. 
From there, they're going to then start building innovations to address some of those issues and test them at Southern State. If those things work well down there, we're going to try to scale up some of those solutions to the entire system. But concurrent to that process, we also have hired the Moss Group, uh, as Al was mentioning, kind of the leading group in the country of corrections consultants that, that have studied some of the other facilities and identified um, pain points among staff. The, the really interesting thing in both the PRIN survey, which I don't want to get too far ahead of, uh, but also the Moss Group findings is that staff actually really like their job and they want to do the work, um, but they don't feel that the department is there to meet them and provide the, those services that I was mentioning at the beginning. And so that's where the department, I feel like, has, has fallen short and it's um, trying to support the team that it has in place. And so that's where I think we need to focus. And, and many of the initiatives that I laid out earlier are a way to target some of that Certainly, that's not an exhaustive list, and we have a lot more work that we can do. Um, but, it, but it occurs to me that the, the running thread throughout that, and I'll connect this to recruitment in a moment, is that people want to be valued as human beings. And I don't know, I think maybe we got away from that a little bit. Um, and, and we need to reconnect with our staff and express to them how much we appreciate them and how much we care about them and we want them to keep doing the work. Um, and so I think if, if we can even move the needle on that a little bit, it will have a huge impact on our staff and it will make them feel valued and into the system. One, one data point that I have to back up my theory on that is uh, our team at Northwest um, has been recruiting up a storm. And, and they're, they're really setting the trend for the rest of the system on how we do recruitment. We just had a meeting yesterday with all of the superintendents and all the district managers. And we had a presentation from the, the guy who's heading up the recruitment effort at Northwest. And, and he shared all of his best practices. And the thing that stuck, that stuck out in his presentation to me is he said, the best thing you can do is connect with them on a human level. And so he calls every applicant every day while they're in the process and checks in with them and lets them know that we want them to come on board and here's, here's what we can do for you. How are you feeling about the process? Those types of questions. And it's not solely because of that, but it is in large part because of that, that human connection is helping people get all the way through the process where we see at some of the other facilities, people will initiate the process, but fall off as the process goes on because it can be cumbersome and challenging and, and other opportunities come along. But what he's doing is making that human connection with our applicants. We also need to do that with the talent we have in the system and, and, and they deserve that from us. We owe that to them. Thanks. And just the thanks. I appreciate that because this has been a, a, a real, a, a thorny issue for a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, Staffing needs, I mean, I think we generally have an impression that the staffing crisis is with the correctional officers and the number of, but it, it, can you just sort of give us a breakdown, a picture of the whole correction system and where the most acute staffing needs are? I mean, it, we don't hear about food service. We don't hear about, you know, we don't, so is, are we, anyway, if you just give us a, a sense of where the acute staffing needs are. Be yeah, right. I'll, I'll let Al keep me honest on this, but our, our most acute staffing needs are certainly in the facilities. Um, it's our security staff, our, our frontline staff. Um, I think, you know, there's certainly uh, staffing concerns in the district offices, which are our probation and parole offices. Um, but I think the, the staffing concern that is top of mind for everybody is within the facilities themselves. They're the staff that have had to incur the greatest burden um, throughout, particularly throughout COVID, but even before. Um, they're, they're the staff that, you know, we, we can't afford not to have that staff in place to maintain the safety and security of a facility. Whereas a probation office is very important to have 24 hour coverage also, but, it, but it's different, you know, it'd be like, um, managing a hospital versus having a family practice doctor on call. Um, that's where we face the most acute challenges. You know, I think if we look system wide, the, the vacancy rate for the system is around 20%. I think if you pared that down just to our security staff, that number grows a, a fair amount. And that's the area that we need to focus the most on. And security staff are COs? Sorry, yeah, I use that term kind of inartfully. I, I mean, individuals at the facility. So that would be our COs, our shift supervisors. Um, our, our casework staff, all of the individuals that keep the facility up and running and, and do the daily work on the front line there. Thanks. And good luck. 
<laughs> Thank you. So I, I, this is just a comment and I, oh, I see Senator Romhin still has a question. Um, well, uh, Nicholas, this is at least my first time connecting with you and I had a big picture question. Um, we have the commission, uh, the Department of Public Safety seeking to be an agency of public safety. It's always been a curiosity to me that we have a Department of Corrections and not an agency and that you're in human services and not connected to the rest of public safety. Um, do you have any thoughts on this reorganization being requested by public safety and whether or not you would want to have a hand in that conversation? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that makes you Vermont unique in this space is that the Department of Correction is housed in the Agency of Human Services. Uh, and the message that that sends to me, and I think this is the message that Vermont is trying to send symbolically, is that we view the practice of corrections as the provision of a human service. And, and we really want to keep um, the focus on for those in our care and custody, the incarcerated population, they need to be treated with dignity and respect. They need to be provided services to help them rehabilitate, to help them create the best positive reentry circumstance that we can. Um, and I think that's an important message to send. And so uh, I, I won't go too far forward on, on discussing the, the desires of the Department of Public Safety, but I will say from the Department of Corrections perspective, um, being housed in the Agency of Human Services has an immense symbolic value, I think, to Vermont. And it, it demonstrates Vermont's prioritization when it looks at corrections. Because you're right, in most other states, uh, it's either a standalone department or it's housed within some type of broader law enforcement um, agency. And um, I think Vermont made a, a very... Uh, specific explicit choice in, in housing them within the agency of human services. And so I don't have any position on how they should reformat themselves for public safety and I wish them the best. Um, certainly, I don't think the department at this point should be uh, a broader agency and, and I'm only a few months in. So I think looking for a promotion at this point would be a little uh, inappropriate, <laughs> but um, I think we're, we're where we should be right now. Thank you. And that to me sounds like an argument for why public safety should be more of a human service um, rather than promoting it to an agency. So I appreciate that sentiment. So I just, uh, before I go to Senator Calmore, I will say that when this, when the issue of um, moving the Department of Public Safety to an agency first came up, which was about, um, let's see, Senator, uh, Senator Scott, Governor Scott has been governor for I think six years and it was during the Shumlin administration that it first came up, so at least seven or eight years ago. One of the considerations was, should the Department of Corrections be moved into public safety? And there was quite a conversation. And as you said, Commissioner, everybody agreed that it should stay in the Agency of Human Services. So that, that, that was taken head on at the time and the decision was made to keep it where it is. Um, let's see, Senator Colmore had his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Commissioner, welcome. And Al and Rachel, it's good to see you. Um, when you were answering Senator Clarkson's question, you mentioned, I think, that there's a 20% shortfall in terms of staff. Um, what does that translate into numbers, if you would? You know, how many people? And what are your impressions of the... Um, challenges, I guess, in terms of recruiting people into the department? What, you know, what, how could we help? What could the state do to improve the uh, chances that we're going to get some really good qualified people to, uh, to join you? Uh, well, now you're challenging me, Senator, to do some arithmetic, and it's, it's never been my strong suit, uh, unfortunately. As a, as a lawyer, I try to avoid math as much as possible. Um, Just a rough estimate, then. Yeah. You know, I think this total staff number is somewhere around a thousand plus or minus. So you take twenty percent. So we're probably talking we're we're short about two hundred or so system wide. But the, but I could be wrong, and so I don't want you to quote me uh, exactly on those numbers. But it's certainly something we can pull that report down for you and send it over so that you have the exact figures. So that makes sense. That you know the uh, the overtime, the pressure on the overtime is uh, is considerable at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what about the what about the challenges that we could help with? 
you know, just to back up for one second before I move on, you know, that, that 20% is system wide. So that's not just the facilities. Um, so that's that includes the central office, which is basically our headquarters staff. Um, and then that also includes all of our uh, probation parole offices, the academy, um, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it, but that's not to say that isn't a huge problem everywhere. It is. And it's something we need to address. Um, and then, sorry, the second part of your question was, um, how do I assess our challenges? Is that? Yeah. In other words, I assume we're not alone in facing uh, recruitment challenges. There's other states that, mm -hmm. that probably would be in a similar position. Can you think of things that we could specifically address to make working at the DOC uh, more attractive for people, especially from out of state to move here to do that? Yeah, great question. Um, so I can tell you firsthand, having spoken with the corrections leaders from around the country, that this problem is universal. It's being faced everywhere in every Department of Corrections uh, across the country. Um, and we've explored, you know, th there's an organization of correction leaders, basically the executives from all 50 states and some of the U.S. territories, and, and we have a very um, tight connection, close relationship. And so we routinely share information between each other. And, and one of the things we've worked to share a lot is best practices on recruitment. Um, I think everything that has been proposed and, and tried in other places that was successful, we've tried to do here as well. Um, and certainly there's more that we can do, but the department is, is very aggressively advertising for positions on social media, on uh, recruitment websites. Uh, we have uh, advertisements through WCAX and other local outlets. Um, and so we're, we're pushing that area. I think that could be a growth area for us. Um, as I mentioned, Northwest is doing very well in its recruitment efforts. And so they shared some of their best, best practices yesterday. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I've already talked a lot about is, is making that human connection and, and dedicating somebody to really usher people through the process. That's really helpful. Um, cutting down on some of the, we'll call it the red tape uh, of the process is a challenge that we've seen. So, um, you know, if we have a posting on a recruitment website, for example, sometimes folks will go on there and, and upload a resume or, or fill out information, and then they're they're redirected to the state site and have to repeat that process. Those kind of redundancies, people fall out of the process at that point, you know, and I think we've all experienced that in the internet age where you start to do something and it doesn't work or you have to do it again, you just throw your arms up and walk away. Um, so we want to cut down on any of those redundancies and red tape, and we're working with our partners across the state to be able to do that. Um, the other thing is, is targeting the individuals that we really want in the system uh, and finding the best talent. And so we've targeted individuals with previous military background because we know that they share a lot of the values of our correction staff. We've targeted individuals who are similarly situated educationally or in pay to give them, hey, you know, the state offers great benefits. Come here instead and we'll give you a whole career here where you can continue to grow and, and change and evolve as a professional. Um, all of these things, you know, I think are, are working, um, but we have to find new ways to reach people. And it's just, a, I think, a reality. It's a reality everywhere in the country, but certainly acutely so in Vermont. There's not a lot of people to go out and pursue. And so we need to be competitive with these other um, similarly situated careers and convince people that, that this is the career of choice. This should be the, pe the preference for folks. Thank you, Commissioner. Senator Clarkson. Thank you, Senator. Thanks. Just to tag on to what you had said previously, Nicholas, is the, I mean, as you look to targeting your recruitment, it does strike me as you're under the umbrella of Agency of Human Services, I would also target people whose career, whose interests are in people. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, military is one, but I wouldn't, I mean, I, I, I guess you would think that, I mean, Anyway, you're a CIA person, so you you have, have perhaps more confidence in that, uh, you, you know, in that way. But I mean, I think that looking at AHS is 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 an interesting idea, and looking to people who have more uh, of a psychology background and a uh, a human skills background would also be useful. I think military is a great idea, but I also think that you're really looking broadly at 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 the agency with which you're in and looking at those trainings in those particular areas also would be very useful. Um, 
as you look to targeting recruitment? You know, Senator, that's a, it's an extremely valid point. And uh, if we really step back and look at what is the future of the corrections practice, that's the way we're going, um, you know, and we talk about this amongst the, the executives across the country as well. And we look at five now, but five, 10 years out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, th that's where the, the practice of corrections is going. And, and that type of infusion of, of human, uh, emotional, mental health thought, um, et cetera. I think where we've seen that in practice really effectively is in our recruitment and retention of probation parole officers who are doing you know, that type of casework out in the field every day. And, and folks have been very successful who have come in with that type of background. Um, but it's certainly something that I think we could explore as we look to recruit for the facilities as well. Absolutely. Well, and, and I say this with some experience, my godson is now a, a, a Marine, but his master's is in psycho psychology and was trained um, at Columbia and he was recruited by the Marines He's now in Japan, but he was recruited to do work in the military because of his his background in psychology, and uh, and he's going on to do his doctorate at, at some point. But it's it I think we forget to look at at the the world that really understands human nature and or at least is trying to, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a lifelong practice and study. Uh, so I I encourage you to 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 think in those directions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. So I am going to, I think, jump to see if Rachel has anything to add here, anything, and then we'll jump to Steve Howard. And, and then we can continue to ask questions of uh, the commissioner and Al, but I wanted to make sure that we heard from Rachel and Steve. Oh, thank you, Senator White. Um, for the record, Rachel Feldman, Public Information Officer and Principal Assistant for the Department of Corrections. And I am just working on getting all that information for you that both the commissioner and Chief Cormier mentioned. So you should have that in your inboxes in about five minutes along with our staffing numbers. Thank you, thank you. Very efficient. <laughs> so um, I, I was going to ask the question at one point, if, if a, somebody is a correctional officer one and you talked about um having them supporting them in their uh desire to maybe become a shift supervisor or something what if what they really want to do is become the chief of operations i mean that not not that anybody would want to replace you al but just i mean that they wanted to not um pursue an advancement in the facilities themselves, but in the central office? Yeah, that's a great question, Senator. I wish we had somebody here who had started as a CO1 and worked his way all the way up to be the chief of operations. Um, oh, maybe oh, Al oh, maybe like comment on this uh, question. He might be best prepared to-, to Al, Al is questions. our man. <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to explain my career. So, some people may say I, I can't hold a job. That, that could be it, but- um, no, I, I think the one thing that's, that's very unique with, with Corrections in Vermont is one, being in the Agency of Human Services and being a unified department where in, in other states, probation is separate, parole is separate, the court has the, the county system. Vermont, we've got it all. So it, it provides an immense opportunity for growth and, and career advancement as a result of that. And in my career, I started as, as a correctional officer. I promoted to a correctional officer too. I then saw an opportunity for community correctional officer in the, in the community, applied for that position, became a community correctional officer, became a probation and parole officer, became a supervisor, um, did a small stint in central office, went back to being a supervisor, became superintendent of a correctional facility for eight years director of facilities and, and now sitting in my current current position. So 27 and a half years with the department has provided a, an amazing opportunity with, with a variety of jobs. Um, and, and that's, you know, we've got casework. I was never a casework in a facility, but that, you know, that's that's something that's out there. Um, our out-of-state unit, we have caseworkers for, for the out-of-state population. And I know we want to bring those back, but currently that, that's, a, that's a job. Um, recreation, recreation coordinators, volunteer coordinators, 
um, food services. Uh, you know, there, there are so many different opportunities within the department. Our policy development unit um, in, in central office, our sentence computation unit in, in central office, uh, you know, the operations managers that work with, with our field services, the operations managers that work with our facility op managers. I mean, there, there are so many different opportunities and, and areas for growth. It's, it, it really does provide an amazing career. Um, and I'm, you know, very proud to, to be sitting where I am as, as a result of that. And, um, it doesn't come easy by any means. I mean, you got to want to be driven and, and have some determination, but it's also to the commissioner's point about, um, you know, professional development. People want to, they're going to have to want to promote. They're going to have to want to do the work. It, you know, it doesn't come easy. And, and to the commissioner's point on, on, you know, promotional opportunities and merit-based. And I've, I've seen as, as a superintendent, I saw a lot of staff that, that went out on their own and, and took online courses through the National Institute of Corrections and, and, and learned an extra skill and, and got a certificate as a result of that. And that's, that's an, an opportunity that's available to anybody that's employed by the Department of Corrections. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities. Become a trainer, be, you know, go to the academy and become a, a trainer for trainers. And, um, so our, our staff have those abilities to become a trainer in a, in a certain area and that, you know, they add that to the resume and maybe that takes them to, to the Department of Children and Families and, and that's fine, but we're, you know, we're making them better people than, than when they came in. And, and I think that's, that's what's important is, is to understand that, that we can provide the, the training and the resources to allow people to promote and, and, and have a really good career. Thank the you. only thing I'd add, Senator, to Al's comment is, um, and, and Al's a perfect example of, of where the system has worked right. You know, we got the right man for the job and, and he's doing an excellent job. W to your question, if, if the CO1, maybe he's a year in, a couple of years in, maybe she's a couple of years in, comes and says, I want to be the chief of operations. I want the department to meet them at that table and say, okay here's what it's gonna take. Here are some skills you need to get and here's how we can help you get them and get you to that point. And it might take 27 years, hopefully not for some, some of the younger folks, uh, but there needs to be an investment by the department to say, this person wants this, we can get them there. Okay. That was what I was hoping you would say. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Clarkson, and then we'll go to Steve Howard. So I, I, I'm vice chair of Senate Economic Development, and I just, I can't let Al's comments, uh, and in some ways yours comments, Nicholas, about professional development, uh, go without saying, are, uh, are the people who are in corrections also need professional development? Uh, TJ always says a good paying, you know, the best response to public, you know, the best improvement for public safety is a good paying job. I, I hunger for us to do a better job on career and technical education training within the facility and on education. And I would love to have you come back at some point to economic development and talk to us about workforce development within, because we need professional development within corrections as much as with the staff. And the, speaking of opportunity, there is an opportunity, it's called corrections to change lives and correct course. So at, at some point, I just had to put that flag down because Al's, you know, the, the talk about professional development is, is both in and out. Right. Yeah, Senator, we couldn't agree more. And, and certainly we welcome that opportunity to testify on those topics. We didn't prepare that today. No, for you I, I, I realize. On staff, but it's certainly an area where I think there's a lot of change coming in the next year to two to three years. To, to try to really meet what you're talking about and, and get the best uh, retraining and, and preparation for folks to go out and, and be successful in the workforce and find jobs that are fulfilling and, and validating for them as well. Thank you. Um, Steve, do you want to add anything? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Steve Howard, I'm the Executive Director of the BSEA. It's always nice to be back in my favorite committee once again, even if not live. <laughs> um, but it's now that I, <laughs> well, someday I hope to be in the same room. Ah, that's different. Uh, someday soon, I hope, if I can remember how to get to the state house. Um, I want to start uh, since 
since the commissioner has been uh, very forthright in admitting that numbers are his weakness, that's where I want to begin uh, because that's uh, that's probably where I'll be the most successful. Uh, but let me just start with um, just give you a picture of the overtime scenario in the Department of Corrections, right hot off the presses uh, from the in, from the um, workforce report that was just put out by the Department of Human Resources. In 2017, the Department of Corrections had 19,000. 909 hours of overtime. In FY21, 31,528. That's a 15% growth in one year between 2020, FY20, and FY21. Um, we are uh, facing a 44% turnover in a correction, correction CO1 positions in FY21. And that is after 30% each year for the three years that preceded that. We are in a five alarm fire. This is a immediate crisis. And while I appreciate a lot of what the commissioner said and some of the talk that has been shared earlier about professional development and, and all of those things, which are very important things, we have an immediate crisis on our hands and we cannot seem to get an immediate crisis response. Um, and that is very frustrating to the men and women who are holding this crumbling system together and have been for a number of years. Um, and so I think that's the first thing that I would say is we need from the commissioner and frankly from the governor an immediate plan to deal with this crisis. And I'm glad to hear that the commissioner is open to some good ideas because I have some good ideas. Uh, that I have I've shared, I spent my summer in every correctional facility and every PMP office and, and, and over and over and over again through the summer and the fall. And I sat and listened very carefully to what, the, what our members were saying about their experience in corrections. Um, and the first thing I would say is we are in such a serious problem. People are exhausted. They feel unsafe at work. They have not seen their families or their children in years. Literally, they've skipped basketball games and soccer games and football games and birthday parties and Christmas and you name it. They've missed all that. Um, they are disenchanted and they are exhausted. And so and when I asked our members to describe just some of the words that I should use in my testimony here when I'm talking with the legislature, the words that I hear are crisis, urgent, dangerous, help. So professional development plans are great, but we need something right now in, in an urgent capacity to address a very dangerous situation that is not only in the facilities, but is spilling out into the communities because we're pulling people out of the field into facilities into hospitals and they are being worked to death. And so they are leaving. I can't tell you how many times in my tour around facilities this summer, I had a correctional officer come to me and say, my partner said that it's me or this job. You either, I'm tired of being a single parent. You either decide if you're married to the Department of Corrections or you, you come home to us. And so they quit or they don't, they sit there, one man broke down in tears because he said, I need this job, but I also love my wife and she's gonna leave me if I don't quit this job. And that's the situation we're in. Now we are very glad that we reached the recruitment and retention bonus. That should be made permanent. And I would just say, honestly, the administration and probably the legislature are gonna have to just come to terms with the fact that in order to staff these facilities and the field, it's going to cost more money and they should plan for 10, 15, $20 million more, not only just to fill the slots, but to fill the slots with people who will run the Department of Corrections on the ground in a way that is, reaches the level of expectation that Vermonters have. It's going to mean a significant investment in the people. Uh, that are that are uh, both there and we don't want to have leave and the people who we want to have come. And incidentally, 
I love TV ads. I love Facebook ads. I love all that. But ultimately, what works in the Department of Corrections and in state government is if somebody goes to their friends and their family and says, this is a good place to work. Come work here. That's what's happening up in Northwest. That's what's happening up there. Um, they won't do that in most facilities around the state. And they'll tell you that they won't do it because they don't want to lose their friend and they don't want to, they don't want to hurt their family member who will never see their family members, who will be working 16 hour shifts day after day after day, who will be sleeping in the parking lot of their facility, who will be falling asleep on their way home. This is a crisis that Governor Scott should be on briefing our members and the public on every single week. It is that bad. And so I, I just wanna stress the level of urgency in that, in that discussion. 50% of our CO1s have less than five years of experience. So another great idea, which this committee has heard about, of course, Senator White has heard probably more than she'll ever wanna hear. We have got to fix the retirement system for correctional officers. We've got to be competitive with the states in New England that offer an early retirement because this job is a traumatic job. The life expectancy of a correctional officer is 59 years old. The life expectancy of the rest of us, if we're lucky, is 75. They have PTSD rates higher than veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. They have high levels of alcoholism um, and, and uh, high blood pressure and 50% divorce rates. We are killing these people. We are killing them. And unfortunately, in the last few um, years, our members have been made to feel like they're the enemy. Like somehow they're the enemy because a reporter decides to write a story, we have to have a big investigation. Fine, have an investigation. But what wasn't part of that investigation was a look at the management that has failed the system. That facility in Chittenden, which was the subject of that investigation, six superintendents in seven years. Why? Where are those superintendents now? Why is that happening all throughout the system? That wasn't part of the, that wasn't part of the, the, of the study and, and it didn't make it into the bill that was drafted by the management of the Department of Corrections. That is very disappointing uh, from our members' perspective. They wanna know why, why is that happening? So the first thing I would suggest is that the administration and the legislature pour money into this department to try to stabilize the department. And then I would suggest that we have a study of the management structure of this department and the management practices of this department. Why are there six superintendents in seven years? That needs to be looked at in a very serious way. And we need long-term reform of benefits like the retirement system so that we're competitive with New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, who all have better, more generous retirement benefits than Vermont has. We need people to make a career of it and to see that if they are gonna do this difficult work that nobody else wants to do, then they have to see a light at the end of the tunnel. But yes, they can have career development throughout the process, and that's very important. But they need to say, yes, I can take this until I'm 55 and then I can retire. Because this job is not only mentally and mentally demanding, it's also physically demanding. And once you start to get past 55, it gets a little harder to wrestle somebody who's 20 to the ground. And remember, it's really important to remember, we have to have mental health services, not just uh, for our members and for, for the offenders, but we have to remember that there is, there's a dual role of uh, mental health and social services and security. And security isn't just for the public. It's not just for our members. Security is for the other inmates who might not be able to protect themselves. And that's what we're honestly hearing from, uh, from offenders who are saying, I think the staffing is a problem because I don't feel safe. There are not enough CEOs to keep me safe in these facilities. So I, I just want to stress um, how urgent the situation is. And, and I just want to say, because I want to be fair to the new commissioner and I, we've had a couple of exchanges and they've been pretty pleasant. Um, and it's, it, he's got a huge task on his hands. But one of the things that our members 
are really hoping for with this commissioner and with this governor is for leadership. And sometimes that means you have to go straight to the power powers that be and tell the truth. And that hasn't always been the case with the leadership of the Department of Corrections. Um, it's been a challenge for them to get information to the governor so that the governor knows what's happening in the, in the Department of Corrections he's responsible for. Sometimes he's shocked when we tell him what's happening in his Department of Corrections. So that is gonna be a challenge for this commissioner. And I think um, the union has a role in helping get around that, but frankly, legislators can help with that. They can make sure that the governor knows what's happening in those facilities, because sometimes he doesn't, um, and he's quite surprised. Uh, that can't happen. I will say to Governor Scott's credit, we got this retention and recruitment bonus um, after months of hard, hard lobbying to get our correctional officers in front of the governor. It took three months, and finally, we got that meeting. And when we did, and when the governor heard directly from them how difficult their jobs are and what the impact of this crisis is, he responded. And so he gets credit for that. Um, but we've got to do much more. That was just a, a beginning, just a, a start. It's a good start, but we have got so much more to do. Um, so I think I would, I think I'll, I'll conclude with that and just hope that um, when you think about correctional officers and you think about probation and parole officers, I mean, Senator White now has, she, she now has somebody who she worked with all summer, uh, Leona Watt, who is a star in this department uh, and who everybody respects and honors as one of the leaders in, in this department. Um, but these men and women like Leona, like so many of them, they're mothers and fathers, they're little league coaches, they're neighbors, they are regular people. And I have to say, I wanna give the commissioner credit. We have in the last few years, in some ways dehumanized them. And we've read statistics or read reports about them and we've forgotten that these are real men and women. They break down and cry, I've seen them do it. This is a really difficult situation. And I, I guess what I would ask the legislature to do is sound the alarm. There is a five alarm fire burning out of control and it needs immediate attention. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do have a question here and I'm not sure because um, I agree. I think we have a, a real crisis right now that needs attention. And I applaud the long-term um, changes because I think they'll make real a real difference in the long term but I I and I know that you said you had some very specific um, recommendations but when I was writing down the recommendations that you had here they seemed pretty long term not immediate like like the pension system and that is under consideration right now but that that kind of is for I don't know that that would recruit a lot of people, but I don't think that that solves an immediate issue and the management structure study. So do you have ideas that the legislature, other than sounding the alarm, can actually do to make, to make a difference and to make changes? I, because if there are legislative changes that need to be made, I mean, putting more money in, is certainly um, one thing, but how, how that money would be spent is gonna make a huge difference because we don't wanna just put 15 million in and then say it's gonna make a difference in the long term. So what are some of the, and maybe that's putting you on the spot, but what are some of the very specific things right now that we can do? Well, um, some of those things are things that we, that are, um, subject collect to collective bargaining. But I will say that the, the first thing that I would do is pour money into the department specifically to raise the wages and the benefits of the people who are working there. And we have to have, um, we have, to have uh, a reflection of the fact that the market rate 
is for this particular profession is too low. The rate that we're paying is too low. The commissioner has in right now in his power in the contract that exists right now, uh, the ability to do a market factor adjustment that should happen and that should be funded by the legislature. There is also the ability, the commissioner has the ability to issue merit bonuses um, and those should be issued right away. We should continue the deal to work to start working on the, um, we should continue the deal that was put in place in, in um, over the summer, but we should do more than that because it's going to require more than that. These are so, these jobs are so difficult and only getting more difficult. And we have to put our money where, um, we have to invest our money in the people because the people are the ones who decide whether or not the system succeeds or fails. And if they, they, need, this, they need that support. So that's the, those are the first two things. I also think um, group G, which is the retirement plan, is an important thing to get done in the legislature. And it would be great if the commissioner and the governor would support that plan, publicly support it and say to the legislature, it has to be done. Uh, that would be a great step. Now that would be, I understand the politics of that. It's tough. Yep. It's above the commission. But it's, state, it's, right? it's in the works. It's in the works. I can't, I'm not gonna comment on that one at all because we don't yet know what the group C plan looks like. So it's really hard to have the commissioner and the governor come out in support of it when we don't yet know what the plan is. It would be helpful, I think, to our members to hear the commissioner say that he will fight for it and he supports it. But not just the commissioner, also the governor. Uh, he needs to say that, I think. And that is a way of both telling our members that he, they're on our side, they understand the problem, but also saying to the legislature, you've got to get this done. This has got to get done. This is a must have before the legislature leaves. And that kind of leadership from the governor and from the commissioner, I think can make a significant difference. I've seen it happen in the state house before. Um, so, so while there are, are details to be worked out, um, I think that kind of immediate action would send the right kind of message to the legislature and prioritize that. Um, we've not, we have not yet had the governor say he supports group G and we believe I, he should say that. I don't want to talk anymore about Group G because the Pension Task Force has yet to receive the actuarial report on Group G. So there is no such thing as Group G. And in theory, the Pension Task Force and my guess is this committee probably support uh, some, some kind of Group G. But we have not, it's really hard to ask people to come out in support of it before the details are done and they aren't done by the actuaries yet. So I, I, I think that the task force has made it very clear to corrections officers that we do support this in concept, we just need the details. So. That's a very important point, Madam Chair. Senator Clarkson. Sorry, I'm trying to be good. Um, <laughs> Steve, uh, yes. I understand. I understand this study is going on at South uh, East. I also understand, given I represent that neck of the woods, that one of our biggest challenges is, is having correctional officers being poached by Massachusetts and New Hampshire, our adjoining states. And, and I don't know about New York. Uh, New York's closing a lot of the prisons that are close to us. So I don't know how big a competitor they are for poaching our, our people, but what are they, I mean, when you go to immediate, uh, immediate suggestions for immediate action on how to improve things, what are they offering our correctional officers other than just more money? And it may just be more money, but I doubt it. Uh, what are they offering that we aren't offering and how can we meet that? And so anyway, well, I guess more that's money. my question. More I, money is, I think that's a very good question, Senator, and I appreciate it. More money is certainly um, an important um, aspect. Market factor adjustment is a tool that has been used um, in our medical, in our healthcare facilities that the state runs. It could be used in the correctional system and the, and the commissioner can do that now. Um, so that would be an important first step. Uh, the other thing I would say is it's really important um, for, you've heard me talk about the disconnect that exists between people who work in facilities and work in the field and the folks who work, the managers in central office. 
And the commissioner has a chance, no one expects he would have done it by now, but he certainly has a chance to fix that. And he, the, the, the tour that he recently did, I think was well received, um, but our members need to see the managers in central office in the facilities, not just talking to the superintendent, but actually going down in and talking to COs on the third shift in the middle of the night. Um, those kind of things need to happen and they haven't happened in years. We've got to get the managers from central office out into the field and into the facilities. The COs need to know them, need to talk to them. They need to talk to the COs. As we learned from, the, from so many experiences, when you hear from frontline workers, you can find the solutions to the, to the significant number of problems that face this department. They have ideas about how to fix it, um, but they need somebody who knows them, who will spend time with them and who will listen to them, uh, who, have, who have the power to make those changes. So, so those are some immediate things that aren't, mm -hmm. that aren't financial um, in nature that could happen pretty quickly. And, and can you just, I mean, if you may not have a better answer than the, because I mean, I have, we have a real concern in Southeast of, of the poaching uh, and that adds to our incredibly high turnover rate. And I think it has one of the highest turnover rates Southeast. So I, I, um, I may be wrong on that, but I thought it was pretty you mean, high. You mean Southern state? I mean, southern I mean, state. Southern state. Wait, we are Southeast, so I can say <laughs> Southeast southern should state. be open, but it's not. <laughs> right, right, right. Southern, right, right. So, yeah. I, so in addition to money, is there something else that New Hampshire and Massachusetts are offering that we aren't offering? Is there something else that we could be? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's financial. I think it's the. It's the way um, uh, they feel. Uh, they're they're treated by the management. I will say that our members. Um, this is going to be slightly confusing to Senator White, but I will say this. Our, we did survey our members around the Agency of Public Safety, and we surveyed our law enforcement members and our corrections members. And uh, our law enforcement members overwhelmingly do not want to be part of the Agency of Public Safety. Interestingly enough, our corrections members do want to be in the Agency of Public Safety by an overwhelming, almost unanimous. Um, and, and so I, I think there's also... Um, you know, some advantages that they feel uh, to that. And as, as uh, you've heard here today, there, there are states who do that, who have their, have a, um, their uh, CEOs in, the, in an agency of public safety. And is, um, is that true in Massachusetts or New Hampshire? You know, I don't know uh, off the top of my head if that's true. I just know that that's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly the feeling or the, those who responded to the survey. And I think it was a pretty significant Tom Abdenor will have to tell us, but it was a pretty significant response to the survey. A large number of people responded. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it was an interesting dichotomy between the two groups um, uh, during that. But, you know, so I think, I think that we can find the solutions to this problem if we um, think about it immediately in a crisis mode with crisis management. And then we can look at more long-term changes, um, both in, term of, in terms of compensation and also in terms of how the department is run. And the legislature has a role to play in that. You have the oversight role um, to make sure that this is, this is getting done and you can hold the governor's feet to the fire uh, to make sure that he's delivering on, on this. This is a serious, serious problem. We are we are really at a breaking point. So what happened last year when we wrote, we wrote a letter um, encouraging a couple of things and was it around bonus and merit yeah. pay and bonuses? Yeah. Um, so I don't know that it did any good, but perhaps we could do the same thing this year from our committee. We can talk about that. We don't have to talk about that now, but we can talk about that um, in a have a discussion on that about whether that would be just to point out from our perspective as an agency or as a committee that deals with state employees we don't deal directly with corrections but we we represent we deal with state employees so maybe we madam, could um i'll take a stab at that and we can talk about it madam madam chair as, as you know your letters are are legendary for Re reaping results um, across state government. 
And I would say that um, it did help um, in getting this, uh, this recruitment and retention package together. That was an enormous all hands on deck task by the VSEA and its members. And your letter did help. Um, you know, we, we, it did help us in fact, get the meeting with the governor that we couldn't get. Um, so I appreciate that it was, it was very effective and I think it would be useful, a useful tool um, uh, to try again. Yes, Senator Rahm Hinsdale. Yeah. Um... I just have a few questions and comments. One, um, I'd just like to be reminded how many Vermonters are incarcerated out of state um, and how many dollars that takes out of state rather than improving facilities here in Vermont. And I'm sure there's different levels of security to contend with, but I want, would love to be reminded of that. Two, you know, I just recall last year we had a major study coming out of some of the uh, allegations and concerns around supervision, substance abuse, sexual assault and coercion. And I was really horrified that so many of the recommendations seemed so disconnected from what the experiences were and talk and spoke for drug testing and lie detector tests for workers who were often the ones who raised the concerns. And so I just really wanna back up um, what Steve is saying about how that escaped a management overhaul and a focus on what's going on at the management level and focused on the staff who were the ones who were trying to improve the situation. And finally, you know, I have emails, speaking of human services and corrections, I don't think it's just symbolic. I mean, I have emails from folks, designated agencies and mental health services saying, we're deeply underfunded, people are leaving you know, our designated agencies and droves for private practice. And then we have mental health crises that fall to law enforcement and corrections to deal with. And so, you know, Nicholas, if you, you know, feel more than symbolically part of human services, I feel like it's also sounding the alarm about the continuum to make sure that people don't end up incarcerated because our other systems that we're underfunding are failing. So yeah. I'm, I, I just want to uh, jump in here with one comment about the, um, the bill that came to us last year that I think you're referring to, Senator, about the polygraphs and the drug testing. If you remember, that did not come from, that did yeah. not come from the commissioner. That came from the, the House committee. The, it, the commissioner had no interest in that part of the bill. It's just demoralizing it past one of these chambers as a, and that right, was right. It answer. is, it is. But I just wanted to remind us that it yeah. didn't come from corrections at all. Yeah. It, um, I don't know why it even was there, but um, yeah. And I think that um, commissioner, if you want to comment on that, but I think that one of the things that we need to remember when we're talking about both people who are incarcerated and the, the uh, corrections officers that, um, work with them is that if we had stayed on the trajectory that we were um, that was predicted that in 2010 by 2021 I believe it was uh, predicted that we would have 2700 or 2800 people incarcerated but because of the uh, judicial and um, re justice reinvestment that Senator Sears has been leading us through. We now have about 1,700, I think. So we have made a, a downward trajectory. And the res one of the results is that the people who are currently incarcerated, and not all of them, but the majority of the people that are currently incarcerated are in the health field, we use the term, a higher level of acuity. I don't know what the term is here, but that makes it even more difficult for the corrections officers because they are dealing with a, um, a population that is at a higher level of acuity. I don't know what we call it. So um, commissioner, I don't know if you had. 
Yeah, absolutely. So to respond to the, the Senator's first question, um, as of this morning, we have 137 incarcerated individuals out of state and they're housed in Mississippi. Um, in the FY23 budget, that line is about 4.5 million. Um, we typically don't spend that total amount and the amount of savings that we recapture from that line is spent in justice reinvestment projects. And so that money through statute comes back into the justice reinvestment work that we're doing here in the state. So that, that was for your out-of-state beds question at that. Um, can you tell me the name of the facility just so I can keep track of that in Mississippi? Yeah. Um, I can. I can I Rachel knows. The county yeah, and the town. Tallahatchie yeah. County Correctional Facility. In Tutwiler, Mississippi. Thank you. I'm glad I catch the spelling, but I will take that under. I can certainly pass that along to you uh, so that you have that information. So that just, just for clarity, Senator, that 4.3 million is allocated for 350 beds. So to the commissioner's point, we have 137 filled now. So that the vacancy rate and the, that rest of that funding is used for justice reinvestment. Oh, any, yes, Senator Clarkson, did you? Yeah, so just to, I'm just, what are your, who makes, is it up to you, uh, the uh, Commissioner Nichols, is it up to you to decide where the justice reinvestment dollars are spent? If it comes back to the Department of Corrections, where, what are your top priorities at the moment for, for spending that reinvestment money? I, and how much is it this year? So that money does come back into the DOC budget, but it, the allocation, the spending of that is based um, in recommendations by a committee that, that reviews those projects and spends that out. Um, and so certainly DOC is a part of that, but that's a broader effort uh, across the state that gets to determine how the justice reinvestment money is spent. So how, how is it being spent this year and how much is there at the moment? Because that's um, quite a number of beds, between what Al is just talking about, between the 300, what did you say, Al, 300 and how many beds? Three, are we're allocated 350. And so that's a huge difference. Uh, so that's a lot of savings. What, what, what are the top priorities and what's the money? So the figures I gave you are for FY23. We can pull down the, the budget adjustment testimony that would capture the FY22, um, the recapture of those funds, and certainly happy to give you testimony on, on where that's gone. Um, there's been a slight lag in the way we've spent justice reinvestment money because that process is still ongoing, and so much of that is, is waiting to be spent, uh, but we can provide you specific testimony on that uh, if that's something that you would appreciate. Well, thank you. And I am going to, I see Steve has a, an answer here or comment. And then I'm going to remind us that we are about 15 minutes behind ourselves. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just be very brief. I just wanted to add just two things uh, to what Senator Rom Hinsdale um, raised. I just want to, uh, first of all, remind the committee that the facility in Mississippi is a private prison uh, owned by Core Civic. Uh, so the state of Vermont is sending money to the private prison industry. Um, which is, most people, I think, would argue, not consistent with Vermont's values. And so that should be addressed in the long term. Uh, but I also wanted to point out something that Senator Rom Hinsdale said about um, just how people felt about some of the uh, allegations um, and how they were handled in the legislation. Um, our members in, in the Downs-Rackland report, five times in that report, it says, uh, there is no widespread evidence of drug use by correctional officers. And yet it was uh, the then commissioner's top priority in that bill. Uh, it made our members feel bad that he viewed them that way. Um, and there's no evidence. His own research said there was no evidence of that. Um, but you raised an important point, which I think is something that the, the commissioner is, sounds like he's going to get on and going to address, which is why did a correctional officer who brought the allegations to the management, why was that ignored by the management? Where are those managers? Right. And I'll tell you where they are. They're in central office today, still employed by the Department of Corrections. And that really bothers our members. So I appreciate you pointing that out. 
because it's it's part of the part of what I think the commissioner heard when he visited the facilities uh, about what happens when you screw up as a CEO, you're out. You screw up as a manager, you move up, and that is a problem. So I appreciate you raising that, and I thank you for the time. So I'm going to suggest that we take a quick, really quick break here. Um, the seven minutes. Is that okay? And thank you, Commissioner and Al and Rachel and Steve. This was, um, and um, we will consider uh, writing one of our famous committee letters that we, we tend to do. Um, and then we'll see where we go from there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This was good. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.